Australia is a land like no other. Barren, parched deserts give way to tropical rainforests, while crystal clear waters merge into a furious ocean. Tens of millions of years of isolated evolution has shaped a country of extremes, and its wildlife is no exception. From ancient armoured monsters to miniature swarming armies, fanged hunters, toxic terrors and apex predators. Australia's animals will biological weapons crafted to dismember, paralyse and kill. However, with a little ingenuity, our deadly Australian wildlife is proving to be as helpful as it is harmful. Nature is the master designer, engineer and chemist. Unlocking its deadly secrets can change lives the world over. Lethal toxins can be transformed into life-saving medications. Curiosities of nature can answer questions of human evolution. Venoms can revolutionise the world of agriculture. My name is Dr Kelly Strebeck, and as a marine scientist, I studied life in the depths of the ocean. But I'm returning to the surface in search of the extreme, the unexpected, the obscure and the misunderstood. Come with me as I jump straight into harm's way, unravel the truths behind some fearsome reputations and meet the scientists transforming the life-threatening into the life-saving. On a journey from stings and bites to scientific heights, we'll discover that Australia doesn't just want to kill you. Australia is a hotspot of biodiversity, teeming with swarming, slithering and scuttling creatures. As science looks to nature to inspire future innovations, Australia's creepy crawlies are a great place to start. On my mission to understand how science is harnessing nature's weapons for our benefit, I'll get a little too close to the most venomous snake in the world. <gasps> Uncover a swarming critter that has already inspired the technology of the future and seek out the stingers poised to revolutionise surgery. But first, I'll face one of my greatest fears to glimpse the future of Australian farming. Despite their frightening appearance and reputation, they are becoming increasingly popular pets in Western countries. Even though they are capable of delivering a massive dose of venom, the sheer size of their fangs alone is usually enough to subdue their prey. They can strike with enough power to puncture a fingernail, and if one bites you, there is not much you can do but ride out the symptoms. A woman bitten by an Australian tarantula reported a painful lesion that spread over two thirds of her thigh. She suffered nausea, many hours of vomiting, extreme pain behind the eyes and sensitivity to light, sudden chills and then copious sweating, and the centimetre long fangs puncturing her skin, that also hurt. Tarantulas don't spin classical webs. Instead, you can find their silk-lined burrows in a variety of habitats across Australia. They're largely distributed across the north, but can range as far south as the tip of Victoria. Australia's tarantulas, often called barking or whistling spiders, are known to be more aggressive than most. When threatened, they may strike with their powerful fangs, but not before they've sent a warning, quite curiously, by whistling. By rubbing modified spines on their front pair of limbs against opposing spines along their jawline, Australia's tarantulas send a clear signal to keep your distance. One man who hasn't kept his distance is bioprospector Stuart Douglas. Since the mid-80s, he has worked with some of the country's most feared creatures, harvesting venoms for potential pharmaceutical application. Together, we're on the hunt for some exciting new candidates. So, Kelly, this is the kind of place that you'd see tarantulas. They love to live along the riverbanks here. That looks like a tarantula hole in this bit of wood. OK, I'm going to be brave and help you. All right, I'll give a tool for you. Ah, uh, yeah, have a poke, see if there's anything in there. This is all I have to defend myself. Yes, they can move quite fast, uh, but uh, you have to be gentle with them as well. Do you know the fastest moving animal on the planet? No, what's that? Me backing away from this <laughs> hole if it comes out. 
<laughs> oh, there's something oh. in there. It's not keen to go in there. There we go. Oh, look at that. Well, that's an Australian tarantula. It's pretty big. Well, it's only about half grown. Really? It gets bigger? Yeah, they get to about the size of my hand. They live for about 20, 25 years. Really? That's pretty impressive as it is, I think. Ah, yeah, they're amazing animals that they're all making life-saving medicines from. Well, I'm just glad it's you collecting them and not me. No worries. Oh, yeah, let's see if we can find another. Like other primitive or miglomorph spiders, tarantulas have very large vertically oriented fangs. They can often overcome their prey just by stabbing them repeatedly. However, to cause paralysis, they can pump a mixture of toxic compounds into the wound. The burrows of female Australian tarantulas can extend to a metre in depth, ensuring a relatively constant temperature throughout the year. Oh, it's going to go backwards. However, it's not just the venom that has therapeutic potential. The web's an amazing thing. Indigenous people from all around the world used to use the web as a, well, an old school band aid. Really? It's sterile and has antibacterial qualities. There we go, now I'm happy. This for you. No worries. Due to the international popularity of pet tarantulas, there is growing concern for local populations, with as many as 10,000 spiders removed illegally each year. To combat this decline, a handful of spider traders have launched captive breeding programs. Before mating, the male announces his presence by drumming his pedipalps, or mating organs, on the ground. Rejection by the female can mean death for some species, but even acceptance leads to a rather aggressive courting display. The much smaller male must jostle the female into position so he can deposit his sperm sac before bidding a hasty retreat. Have we described all of the species of tarantula here in Australia? Uh, no, just the other day they found a new genus. Not species, but genus. Potentially, if people haven't even described the species, people can be collecting possibly deadly spiders? Well, yes. Seeing that we have the most venomous other animals, there is a, a good possibility that one of our Australian tarantulas could be lethal. They're deadly to dogs, though, aren't they? If it bit me, it'd be about eight hours of vomiting a nausea. Beat your cat or dog, it'd be dead in about 15 or 20 minutes. Venom is very specific in its evolution, hence that's why medicine can be made from it. Removing our exotic wildlife threatens local biodiversity, ecosystem balance and even the economy. Because although tarantulas may be aggressive by nature, it is the nature of tarantula venom that could revolutionise the livestock industry. Dr Volker Herzig knows the value of tarantula venom more than most. He's been working with tarantulas for more than 10 years and holds one of the largest collections of arachnid venom in the world. That tarantula can't walk across the glass, can it? Oh yes, it can. Usually in nature, the tarantulas don't look like that. They're only half the size. <laughs> You've been spoiling your tarantulas. I've been spoiling them. What exactly in the tarantula venom are you looking at? My main focus of research is on agricultural pests. Tarantulas mainly feed on, on arthropods, so mainly insects. And therefore their venom contains a lot of insecticidal toxins. So there's a huge potential of novel insecticidal compounds. Broad-spectrum insecticides can be problematic because although they kill unwanted pests, they also target beneficial insects, including pollinators such as bees. In Australia, blowflies are responsible for fly strike, a disease that causes sheep to die a slow and painful death, costing industry an estimated $250 million a year. Finding the best insecticidal molecule is like finding the key to a very specific lock. Traditional insecticides use keys that can open more than just the locks of pest species, but of beneficial insects as well. Proteins are much more precise keys that only open very specific locks, like that of the blowfly. However, before scientists can start screening venom for candidate proteins, they need to extract a sample. How do we collect spider venom? I can show you on this spider here. So I actually milk them by electrical stimulation. 
Rather than having to remove the venom glands, which would kill the spider, light electrical stimulation is applied to the base of the fangs. This causes the glands to gently contract, providing a continuing supply of venom for research while causing no harm to the tarantula. So this venom contains hundreds of different toxins and each of the toxins can have different effects on different insect species. Once the venom is collected, all the different fractions that make up this chemical cocktail need to be separated from one another. The venom is fed through tens of metres of capillary tubing that slowly separates the components, allowing each to be analysed individually. We're testing individual components from the venom on these flies. Yes, that's right. So you put the fly on the needle, injecting into the thorax. Then we wait for it to get it nicely distributed in the fly, and then it's just going to be removed from the needle, and we can test the next fly. It's basically for every toxin that I test, I inject between three to 500 flies. So we can find something that's very specific, and this is actually the aim. Recently, we found one toxin that was paralytic in the blowflies. And this is how we find novel bioinsecticides. The Australian tarantula is an aggressive spider, prized amongst those in search of a more unusual pet. But as it happens, tarantula venom is equally prized by the scientists in search of a compound that will aid future Australian farmers. It's been called elusive, even placid, but don't be mistaken, behind their big dark eyes lies a ferociously efficient killer. The most venomous snake on the planet, the inland taipan is a very specialised mammal hunter, evolved to seek out and kill warm-blooded prey. It's estimated that the venom from a single bite would be enough to kill 100 men and close to 250,000 mice. Inland taipan venom is so deadly, not just because it's incredibly toxic to the nervous system and heart cells, but because it contains a property that causes the venom to spread very rapidly throughout the body, allowing it to act with devastating efficiency. The inland taipan occupies the sparsely populated plains of Australia's desert centre, where Queensland and South Australia meet. The range of its cousin, the coastal taipan, stretches along Queensland's coast all the way to the Kimberley region. While the venom of the inland taipan is more deadly, the coastal taipan is often considered the most dangerous because human encounters occur more often and this taipan is more likely to strike. To gain a greater insight into the deadly nature of snakes, I've agreed to handle one with the aid of Dr Brian Fry an expert whose fascination with snakes has him catching, handling and extracting venom all over the world. So, Brian, what's in venom? So, venoms are modified proteins. So, it's ordinary bodybuilding blocks that have been mutated for a toxic action. And what kind of a snake is this one? So, this is an inland taipan. Drop for drop, it's the most toxic snake in the world, land or sea. And this is also your final exam. I'm not handling an inland taipan. It's hissing at this point. Yeah, it's a little feisty, but we'll have you all trained and you'll be fine. <laughs> Adapted to harsh living conditions, the inland taipan has evolved an efficient offence to subdue and kill its rodent prey. Their potent venom is a complex cocktail of toxins, each with a specific action. Some toxins cause near instant paralysis, others break down muscle, while others still cause internal bleeding. If I'm to handle an inland taipan, I need as much expert guidance as I can get. Today, I am in the very capable hands of Chris Hay, a professional handler who has many years of experience, both working with snakes and with Brian. But before I face off with the world's deadliest, Brian and Chris first have me wrangle a collet snake, which can still kill me, just a little more slowly. So you can see there I've lifted the back part of the snake off the ground. I can then gently grab him like so, move the hook to the front part. 
and the snake is being restrained. You're in control? Absolutely. No, no, no. Oh. Never touch it while it's still on the ground. You can swing back around. Just now lift up and then now grab about here. <gasps> Slide the hook to about two thirds of the body length down and lift. Hey. You're doing a good job. Yeah, Very you. good. For your first snake ever. Next up, it's the King Brown, also known as the Mulga snake. This is one of Australia's largest, with adults reaching more than two and a half metres in length. Ah! You're right, and then grab. And ah! no, that's all right. Oop. Brian, is this snake venomous? Yeah, it's a member of the black snake genus, and these guys have huge venom yields, like over a gram in a single milking. The big broadening of the head, that's because it has monstrous venom glands, huge, huge venom glands. So it's venomous. Is it deadly? Yeah, the snake will be able to kill a person. With two lethal snakes under my belt, or more importantly, back in their bags, it's time for the inland taipan. It would be best never to actively seek out an inland taipan. It is extremely fast and agile, often striking multiple times in the same attack. Having said that, I'm ignoring my own advice. Oh! There we go. You're on. And don't worry, it only has about 100 times the amount of venom that it takes to kill you. Thank you, Brian. And then oh, two thirds oh, oh. of the way and lift. Perfect. Behave. Controlled motions. <gasps> I think I preferred the Molga. <gasps> lift. And this is me handling the world's most venomous snake. That was one of the most terrifying things I've ever had to do. Nature is the master chemist and bartender. More than 90% of the venom cocktail is made up of one particular ingredient, small proteins called peptides. Hundreds and even thousands of peptides. Some peptides are not harmful at all, while other peptides can be completely deadly. Peptides are complicated molecules with very specific functions. Researchers can take advantage of this specificity to develop useful therapeutics with similar yet controlled actions. Bottoms up. I'm heading to Queensland University's Centre for Molecular Biology to meet Professor Paul Aylwood, a man who has spent more than 20 years investigating the properties of some of the most potent Australian venoms. When did we start looking at snakes for therapeutic value? The first efforts were on a viper in South America, which affected blood pressure, and that had our first blockbuster drug, which came out of a snake. For the first time, we knew that snakes could be a source of uh, bioactive components in future drugs. And what sort of snakes were you looking at? Well, we had to get the biggest and the best. We went for the inland taipan, because it was known as the world's most venomous snake, and not a single component was known in the venom. And what sort of peptides did you find? We found a range of coagulants, but the ones that excited us were those that were reminiscent of our own naturetic peptides, which control fluid removal from the heart. Abnormal contraction and relaxation of the heart over prolonged periods restricts blood flow to the rest of the body and can result in chronic heart failure. In industrialised countries, chronic heart failure is believed to affect 2 to 3% of the adult population, increasing to 23% in people over the age of 65. Here in Australia, 30,000 new patients are diagnosed with chronic heart failure each year at a cost of more than $1 billion. Specific naturetic peptides found in the taipan venom relax the muscles around a vertebrate's heart, lowering blood pressure. Not only has this research broadened our understanding of chronic heart failure, it could lead to improved therapies. The peptides formed by the snakes are similar to the ones in human, but quite different in their size. They were much, much more stable in blood plasma and would persist for hours to days. That gives them extra properties, the properties you might like for a drug. 
Isn't that interesting? You think of venom as, as something that only kills people when it's actually teaching us things about ourselves we never knew. Most of the components of most of the venoms don't kill. But some things will actually enhance the physiological processes or block the physiological processes. And pretty much all venoms can be used in that way. There are many different components of the venom affecting human physiology in many different ways, resulting in an abundance of potential drug leads. Internal bleeding, for example, is a major complication of a taipan bite because the venom affects the body's normal ability to clot blood. This disruption to blood coagulation can be harnessed to our advantage. To better understand the effects that taipan venom has on the human body, Dr Brian Fry has prepared a little experiment, this time with the more aggressive coastal taipan. But before we start, we need to extract some venom. It's time to put my new skills into practice. So how far can this strike? About half the body length. So in this case, it's a two and a half metre snake which means it can strike about 1.2 metres. So it could potentially strike me. See how long those fangs are? That is impressive. All right, go ahead and put your end in. Two, one. Perfect. How's the heart rate? Oh, the heart rate's <laughs> definitely up. <laughs> So to have a look at what the venom is actually doing to the human body, mm -hmm. we could run a little experiment. Mm -hmm. And you're it. <laughs> I, am, I am the experiment. Yeah. OK. To demonstrate the effect that taipan venom has on the blood, Dr David Quigley will extract one of the key ingredients for the experiment, 10 cc's to be precise. We'll put five cc's in two different tubes, one that we'll mix venom into and one that will be our control. So what effects are we expecting to see on the blood? So what this is going to do is not replicate what happens if you were bitten, but what would happen if a prey animal was bitten, because we have a large amount of venom and a small amount of blood, so that's going to trigger all of it to become one big blood clot. So if you can see that it's already turned into a solid clot. That was quick. Well, the other one's still liquidy. OK, so the, the venom itself is not actually thinning your blood, it's just using up your ability to clot your blood, and so therefore the blood becomes a lot thinner. Exactly. That is extraordinary. Yeah. Unlike most snakes, the taipan is a specialist mammal hunter, exquisitely adapted to a harsh environment where conserving resources and efficient predation are key to survival. <gasps> now medical research can take advantage of millions of years of evolution using a very select part of the deadly venom to address heart disease. So, considering how many deadly snakes Australia boasts, we really are the lucky country. Not only could it be used directly as a therapeutic, but also used as a way to investigate what's going on. So the more knowledge you have, the better you can design a new drug. Depending on where you are on the planet, they make up to 20% of the terrestrial animal biomass. If we were built with the same strength relative to our body size, we'd be able to lift cars over our heads. Seen alone, they appear mindless. But on mass, they can number in their millions, their social structure and organisation executed with military precision. They are often referred to as the most successful organisms to roam the Earth, with more than 15,000 known species and subspecies. Some bite, some spray acid, and around 9,000 inject venom. Here in Australia, we boast the oldest, largest, and perhaps the most aggressive. Australian ants have placed more than 120 people in hospital over a three-year period and killed six since the 1980s. The Guinness Book of Records lists the Australian bull ant as the world's most deadly. Due to the highly potent venom known to induce anaphylactic shock and the fact that they're so aggressive. There are 89 species of bull ant, 88 of which are found in Australia. The most feared of the bull ants, the jack jumper, 
is named for its characteristic jumping movement. Wielding a retractable sting located in their abdomens, jack jumpers are responsible for around 90% of all life-threatening ant stings. But perhaps more frightening is that unlike other ants who commonly navigate using pheromones or scent, their well-developed vision allows them to sense movement, so they can actively stalk you. Working together in highly organised societies, ant colonies are so united towards the common purpose of survival, growth and reproduction that they behave like a single organism. One of the few groups of animals that modify their immediate environment to suit their needs, ants often build elaborate nests that they can occupy for years, sometimes decades. Only a handful of animals manufacture such complex structures and fewer still, build them with a view. Green tree ants build their cities in the trees. They're known for this unique building behaviour where workers construct balloon-shaped nests weaving together leaves using larval silk. Mainly found in Australia's tropical north, colonies can be extremely large consisting of more than a hundred nests spanning numerous trees and containing more than half a million workers. Highly territorial, the workers will aggressively defend their territories against intruders. Unlike bull ants, green tree ants cannot sting, but bite with their strong mandibles and squirt burning formic acid into the wound. One ant by itself can't do much to harm larger prey, but an ant colony, now that's a force to be reckoned with. By hunting in groups, ants can overwhelm much stronger and larger prey. Ants are very loyal to their own colony and can be quite nasty towards outsiders. Competition among colonies for food and other resources often leads to aggression. If members of a rival colony invade, all-out war can erupt. But it's not just the aggressive nature of ants that interests researchers. Their complex social behaviour has inspired solutions to some problems of tremendous size. I've come to the University of Queensland, where Dr Daniel Angus has used the foraging behaviour of ants to help find solutions to complex engineering problems. When I think of intelligence, an ant isn't the first organism that comes to mind. So ants are an example of what we call a collective intelligence system. An individual ant by itself is fairly dumb. It's actually the colony itself that is the intelligent entity because it's little individual ants working together to solve problems such as finding food, such as tending to the nest. And so you don't have a queen ant kind of there with a megaphone shouting orders at the ant colony and saying, go here, go there. What instead you have is you have this pheromone marker, a chemical marker, that they lay in their environment to try and find efficient paths between a food source and their nest. When initially foraging for food, ants will spread out randomly. When an individual locates a food source, it will lay down a pheromone trail on its path back to the nest. Other ants stumbling upon the pheromone will cease travelling at random, take up the trail and lay down markers of their own. However, the greater the distance to the food, the more time it takes ants to travel and the more time the pheromones have to evaporate. In comparison, shorter paths become loaded with pheromone, encouraging the collective to favour the most efficient route. So the pheromone is their form of communication? Yeah, it's an example of a decentralised system. There's no ant that's actually saying, all right, we're going to kind of go march north and see if we can find food here. They're doing it completely autonomously. And this is really interesting in a computational sense because you can actually have computers that can solve real world engineering problems in a decentralised fashion. The foraging behaviour that ants have relied on for millions of years is proving to have applications for some very modern issues. Ant-based algorithms are being applied to a diverse range of problems, from alleviating traffic congestion in the streets of Tokyo to traffic congestion on the internet. 
In an age where drone technology is playing an ever-expanding role in law enforcement and surveillance, monitoring difficult to reach or dangerous environments, coordinating the mindless individual to become the intelligent mass has never been more important. A single postal truck is doing a round trip between 14 towns. That's 14 individual drop-off points. While there might be one obvious optimal route between each point, there are around 3 billion unique ways to solve the problem. If we expand this map to include 50 drop-off points, the number of solutions becomes impossible to exhaustively solve. More like three, followed by 62 zeros. If our postal service were to behave like an ant colony, we could assemble a team to collectively solve our routing problem. Each truck could lay down a trail as it travelled from one location to the next. If this trail contained useful information, not only could the shortest distance be established, but other useful information could be exchanged, such as traffic conditions. Suddenly, we have a self-organised system of swarm intelligence. So our ants, what else can they teach us? If you're doing surveillance of, say, a bushfire with drones up in the air, how do you make sure that you've got even coverage over the entire national park that might be on fire? Kind of like the pheromone in the ants, each drone can be independent in a way, but then it can actually work in concert with all of the other drones in its local area. So they're communicating with one another? Communication is really expensive. And so if they can actually just do very, very little communication just to their local neighbours, then that might be able to actually save power, keep the drones up in the air for longer. So yeah, we get good coverage over our bushfire that might be raging on the ground. Ants are one of the most successful organisms on the planet. Some are aggressive fighters, others are expert architects, but all species form colonies to coordinate their efforts in solving the challenges of survival. In our increasingly complex world, the intelligence seen in the foraging behaviour of ants can be applied to some complicated problems of our own. So in its simplest form, this is artificial intelligence. So there's one whole branch of AI we refer to as biologically inspired computation. And that's really about systems that are inspired by biology. So it's standing on the shoulders of biologists rather than giants. They are among the oldest venomous lineages to walk the land. Worldwide, there are more than one million stings reported each year, resulting in over 3,000 deaths. Inhabiting every landmass except Antarctica, every one of the 2,000 species is venomous. In Australia, there are around 40 named species, although it's believed that more than 150 may exist. They are mainly nocturnal hunters, but if you want to see them, then they can be easy to find. You just need an ultraviolet light, because, as strange as it might be, they fluoresce in the dark. Australian scorpions are the prime suspects for two infant deaths over the last century. And while they're generally not considered deadly, a sting can leave the victim with intense pain and swelling, followed by nausea, hypertension, and in the worst cases, cardiac arrhythmia. Scorpions are found in a vast array of habitats across Australia, from scorching deserts to lush rainforests. Across the globe, their venom makeup varies from species to species, optimised to the specific predator and prey animals that inhabit each ecosystem. Scorpions hunt nocturnally, feeding mainly on arthropods such as beetles, cockroaches and spiders. Their vision is thought to be poor and instead they use perceptive hairs and sensory organs on their legs to detect the ground vibrations made by their moving prey. Once in reach, scorpions use their clawed, grasping pedipalps to crush their prey or hold it down while they deliver their fatal sting. I'm heading to the Atherton Tablelands to meet a man who has experienced the scorpion's sting on more than one occasion. Jeff O'Connor has one of the largest private collections of venomous arthropods in the country, as well as a thriving trade in the venom that they produce. 
I've noticed with the different species you've got, they have different sized claws. What does that mean for them? The Eurodacus have very large claws simply for crushing their prey. They don't need to use their venom, where the smaller species will have a very powerful venom to take their prey down in seconds rather than minutes. The bigger ones with the bigger claws, that's how they kill their prey rather than using their venom. They do use venom, but it takes 21 days for them to replenish their venom, so it leaves them susceptible. So when we're collecting, it's actually the ones with the small claws that you've got to look out for. Correct. You see, I would have done it the other way around. A lot of people do. The smaller ones pack a lot more of a punch. Do you know that from experience? I do. Mm. Three days of pain from a small lichus. It's only this big and looks rather harmless, but uh, very venomous compared to these ones here. Because venom takes so much energy to produce, scorpions meter the amount they inject. Venom is produced in two glands and ducts connected to their barbed stinger. When the need arises, they strike with their sickle-shaped tail, injecting venom straight into their prey. Jeff's assortment grows ever larger as he seeks out new specimens for his collection. I guess you don't get the beautiful rainforest without a bit of rain. Spot on, and you need the rain to, uh, yeah, to keep all the critters around. You want to have a look? Yeah, OK. You ready for a surprise? There we go. There's a nice pair sitting there. Can I pick it up? Certainly can. Good ah! work. They have big pincers. Yeah. Well, see, they don't have a lot of venom, these ones, so they have large claws to subdue their prey. Ow! <laughs> it's just pinched my finger. And here's the female here, Kelly. I'd look, but I'm too busy keeping an eye on my... Oh, that's the female. That's the female and it's the male. So how do you tell the difference? Uh, it's the female. She's a little stockier and heavier. And this one is the male. Can we get some tubs out. Well done. Each new addition to Jeff's collection holds exciting potential as scientists continue to develop a wide array of venom-based therapeutics. Go and find some more. However, with so many different species of scorpions worldwide, each equipped with a unique venom cocktail, scientists need a way to focus their search for possible drug leads. The best place to start is by investigating the place of the scorpion within the broader food web understanding what they hunt and what, in turn, hunts them. The interaction that exists between predator and prey brought Dr Tobin Northfield to James Cook University in Cairns. His research focuses on nature's evolutionary arms races. As an ecologist, what's your interest in venom? I'm interested in how the venom makes that organism better at catching prey and better at defending itself against predators. And you'll have different components of that venom that are targeting the predator or prey that they're interacting with. There are at least 15 different chemicals in scorpion venoms. The scorpions should optimise those chemicals for the predators that attack it and for the prey that it attacks. So there's an arms race going on out there. It's exactly like an arms race where the scorpion is trying to get the best tools for the job. And an arms race would be a good place to start looking for interesting venom. That's right. The more species you have in a location, the more potential compounds you have in the venoms. These might be particularly good locations to identify different venom components that could be used for pharmaceuticals. The biology of the scorpion's predator and the biology of its prey can be vastly different. In areas with a diverse range of species, the divide can be even greater, driving the need for more formidable weapons. It's on this battleground where scientists have the best chance of discovering new and unique therapeutics, with one compound of scorpion venom having an unexpected application. Chlorotoxin is a compound found in the venom of the Israeli Deathstalker. Scientists have discovered that it has a unique and quite miraculous application. It binds very selectively to tumour cells. By combining it with the fluorescent tag, scorpion venom has the potential to revolutionise the way surgeons locate and remove deadly brain tumours. Each year in Australia, close to 1,400 people are diagnosed with cancerous brain tumours. Even benign tumours can be deadly if they're found in the wrong part of the brain. Surgery can be risky due to a long-standing problem in medicine. 
How do surgeons effectively distinguish between diseased and healthy tissue? While chlorotoxin is not an Australian discovery, important work identifying the structure of the molecule has taken place down under. Dr David Wilson has been working with venoms for more than two decades. His lab is part of an international research effort working to produce a tumour imaging agent called tumour paint. Oh, cool. Now, that's not the chlorotoxins that are fluorescing, is it? No, it's not. The scorpions have a molecule in their outer coating that fluoresces under UV light. That must make it a lot easier to collect them. Yeah, it certainly does. They can go out with a UV torch at night and collect the glowing bits. Collect the glowing bits. How does the tumour paint work? Tumour paint binds to tumour cells and then the tumour paint molecule has a fluorescent label on it. When the surgeons are operating, they can hold a light similar to this and all the tumour cells will fluoresce. It's two different molecules then, one from the scorpion and a fluorescent tag that makes the tumour paint. Yes. Without tumour paint, surgeons just had to guess the difference between good, healthy brain cells and tumour cells. Tumour paint will drastically reduce the risk of removing healthy tissue, with preliminary studies indicating it is 500 times more sensitive at detecting tumours than conventional MRI. In terms of biodiscovery, what part of this process has your lab been contributing to? We know that chlorotoxin binds to tumour cells, but we don't really know how it does that. So what we're looking at is the structure of the molecule itself to see if we can work out the actual mechanism of binding. You can take something from nature and understanding its structure, you can then tweak it to improve it for its purpose. Across the globe, 2,000 species of scorpion produce biological weapons to battle both predators and prey. But the scorpion's arms race is also providing the weapons needed to fight an entirely different war. Chlorotoxin is beginning to change lives the world over. Who knows what else we'll find? Are chlorotoxins the only molecule that we're interested in? No, not at all. The scorpion venoms are very complex mixtures of components and because of the complexity of their venom, there's lots of potential to have molecules that we may be able to use as therapeutics. 